Launched in Australia in October 2021, the all-new Toyota Land Cruiser 300 series, which is the first new Land Cruiser in 14 years, probably hasn't made the sales impact as it could have because we haven't been able to get any. Apparently the wait in Japan is up to four years and initially at least this base model GX here, which you can tell by having a beautiful snorkel over there, although it is very streamlined, starts at 89,990. But people were asking up to 140,000 for brand new models. That's dropped to around 118,000 as we record this. So the list price of this car really is kind of academic, really. It's about what people are willing to pay for it. Why are we testing the GX? Well, this is the new Land Cruiser at its absolute most naked. This is essentially the commercial spec, but does it drive like a commercial vehicle? I suppose that's the whole point, really. It doesn't take very much modification at the dealership to make it look less than this rather spartan looking base car here with these steel 17 inch wheels and very skinny 245 75 Dunlop Grand Trek 17 inch tires which give it a really good ride quality certainly compared to the Sahara on 20s but don't necessarily add a level of expense you can option these sort of smoked grey 18 inch alloys with 265 65 18 inch tires and that makes it look a lot more expensive and probably doesn't cost that much money when you think about it. You could also choose eight colors. I'd choose Merlot red over this silver, but let us know what you think because this is about all of us, not just me. The front of the GX here is very much the same as it is on the next model up, which is the GXL. That costs just under $12,000 more than this car and is probably the private buyer's choice if you're starting at Land Cruiser 300 level. Although, as we shall discover, just because this is stripped out and has that sort of weird looking snorkel over there, doesn't mean that it can't act as a lovely refined day-to-day -day car. Now, we've already covered the Land Cruiser 300 series extensively in our original launch video. It's 29 minutes long. If you want to know everything about the car, then please watch that on a YouTube channel or on our website. But I'll give you a very quick rundown on what this is about. The inspiration behind the 300 series Land Cruiser was that the old car was tiring to drive. And so while this rides on exactly the same 28 50 millimeter wheelbase and is essentially the same size as the old 200 series, the 300 series has sort of grown into itself and become a lot more sophisticated, finessed and refined. In those areas, in particular, it has things like an aluminium bonnet, an aluminium roof, aluminium doors and an aluminium tailgate to try and save weight on the car. The engine's further down and further back and the rear seats have been moved further back to sort of adjust its centre of gravity, which is slightly lower. I think it's six millimetres, which you try and tell that, but at least it's something. And it also has a better front to rear rate distribution. This GX also has the broadest track gain of any of the models because it does has these skinny 245 tires. But you can see that all of that kind of adds up to a vehicle that is about adjusting little things here and there to make it overall a better four-wheel drive and one that's easier to live with. Overall, the GX is pretty much the same as a bunch of other Land Cruiser models above it. These LED lights here are the same at the front, as is the black grille, which is why I reckon when you get the black wheels from the dealership, that it'd look really good on one of these because it sort of ties in with the other colouring. This overall style is similar to the GXL, but it doesn't have roof rails, it has the standard snorkel, and it doesn't have side steps. So if those things matter, then you'll need to pay another 12K or whatever the market is asking for right now to go to the next level at GXL. Underneath here is the same as before, but new. It's the TNGAF platform, double wishbone front suspension, five link coil sprung rear end, locking centre differential on all models except for the GR Sport, the hero car that based upon this costs $50,000 more at retail value. And who knows what really on the second hand market, second hand demo market really, uh, which has front and rear locking differentials. I've driven these off-road. I didn't lock either the front or rear differential on the GR Sport and it did it easy. This four wheel drive does it effortlessly. I don't really know whether it needs that unless it's in really hardcore going 235 millimeters of ground clearance, 3.5 tonne towing capacity, full size spare shoved under the back. This is a very comprehensively designed four wheel drive, even though it probably doesn't look as modern as it is underneath. The technology in the 300 series contributes to a 20% stronger body, but also one that weighs up to 90 kilos. This GX here is the lightest at 2,495 kegs. And part of that is because of the aluminium stuff I mentioned before, including this 
controversial one-piece tailgate. And I say controversial because it used to have a split tailgate and now it has this. And even when it's, that is at maximum height and me at 5'10", can only just kind of fit under there. So not only does it not go very high, especially for a big car, it takes away one of the features people really liked in here in the GX and we are talking base GX. Like GX used to be the top spec in the 80s and now it's the absolute povo. We have GXL, VX, Sahara, GR Sport and Sahara ZX above it. So, yep, she's at the bottom is kind of hose out or at least what appears to be a hose out floor because it's just this sort of overlay on top of the carpeted stuff underneath. It still has four tie down points. It has a 220 volt, 100 watt, three prong outlet over here. Uh, it also has a few hangovers from the seven seat, like it still has the uh, roof grabs in the top of the ceiling here. It still has the cup holders in there, which could probably make up for the fact that it doesn't have the tailgate everyone misses. In terms of the volume, Toyota doesn't claim a below luggage cover amount, and this doesn't even have a luggage cover. So this, at this level, is probably 700 litres-ish. Toyota claims from the floor to the ceiling is 1131, and with the middle row seat down, 2052, which is almost 100 litres more than the seven-seater, because the back floor has to be a little bit higher to fit those extra crapo seats in. GX might mean base shooter in 300 series speak these days, but this actually is a lot better than what you'd imagine the commercial spec Land Cruiser 300 to be. The obvious things are that it has vinyl floor with rubber mats, yeah, big deal. Like, it really does make no difference at all. The fact that it has keyless entry and push button start, I think is much more of a big deal. It has this beautiful leather bound three spoke steering wheel with this really nice sort of heavy baseball style stitching, which also adds a real level of class to it. We have dual zone automatic climate control. We have a nine inch touchscreen here with six speakers. That sounds really good. It has DAB radio. It has wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which you have to do through the USB-A plug here. You can sit your phone where the wireless charging is in the GXL, but you have a USB-C port over here, but that's only for charging and you don't get any in the back. A couple of other little surprise and delights. It has four auto up down power windows, which is a really useful thing to have. You can still fold the mirrors in here electrically, but you have to do it by a switch. It doesn't do it when it locks and unlocks. It doesn't dip them when you reverse, like in the models above it, but hey, no big deal. We also have um, auto high beam button down here. We have radar cruise control on this side of the steering wheel here. Have a little 4.2 inch screen in the center here. There's just a, quite a lot of tech in here that sort of makes you feel really comfortable in what is the commercial spec 300 series. It does have drive mode select here, but it doesn't have all the modes that the models above it have. It just has simple, eco, normal, and sport that you twist through here. You can lock it in second gear here. It has the dynamic crawl, hill descent control, and that sort of stuff. We have a little toggle here for high range four, low range four, because it is full-time four-wheel drive. We can lock the center diff here, and we can tighten the steering angle in a really awkward position if you are in that situation where you need to turn, it'll break the inside back wheel and slightly tighten the turning circle. We have an auto hold button that can hold the brake on in stop start traffic. Um, it's quite comprehensive. When you start to look at the things where it sort of despecs it a little bit, this is all sort of, it's squidgy, but fairly sort of industrial vinyl. It does still open this way and that way, but it doesn't have any cooling inside. Uh, the doors are nicely stitched though. It has this fake plastic stitching that runs along here and runs along the top of the dash and actually gives a pretty good perception of looking fairly high quality. But the weird anachronism for me is that it doesn't even have variable intermittent front wipers. It just has one set delay setting like the 1980s cars I grew up in. I think the rear actually has intermittent, but the front doesn't, so whatever. Uh, in the GX, you also have this really dark sort of nicely flocked roof lining, which is kind of nice, but it's really dark inside this car. This is all very, very gray. And speaking of gray is the seat trim. Someone said it looked like a 1990s Commodore, and I actually don't find that too offensive. It has that sort of mouse fur fluffiness that Japanese cars of 20 years ago had. 
only the driver gets seat height adjustment though the passenger just has four aft adjustment with levers so fairly approximate in its positioning but the driving position in the gx is actually pretty good the seat underneath me is pretty flat there isn't a whole lot of under thigh support but the actual backrest is okay the long distance comfort's pretty good you do eventually blend to it i do like the view ahead though you've got a really great view out through the windscreen and you've got that dip in the bonnet there which is meant to make it easier to see obstacles off-road and i think that that actually does make sense but what doesn't really make sense though is the fact that for such a big four drive you can't get a camping bottle in the door i can only get this like 600 mil coke or something like that nothing barely any bigger this does fit in the center here but i don't feel like the driver wants to drive along with a drink like that all the time although it is kind of out of the way of your arm but you kind of would hope for more right the three most obvious equipment deletions in the GX over the GXL is the fact that it, it doesn't have carpet, it doesn't have any rear air controls, it just has this big plastic panel with Land Cruiser imprinted on it, but two rear air vents, but you just can't control the temp. And you can't really tell because this window goes all the way down, yay, but it doesn't have rear privacy glass either. Other than that, it's still actually a pretty good place to be in here, certainly sitting behind the driver because that seat goes all the way down. I can see over the top of the headrest in front of me, I've got a really great view. The seat is arguably more comfortable in terms of under thigh than the front seat, although that doesn't apply to the mid-center one here. You are having feet on the fairly flat but broad transmission tunnel. That's not the greatest. You don't get a center armrest, but you do get isofix points for the baby seats. You get this little lever thing on the side here where you can do the backrest from here to here, which is actually pretty good. Uh, you still get damped roof grab handles, the BPLO one I mentioned before, and while you don't have any storage here, you can still fit fairly small drink bottle in the door, that's about it. You do have a 12 volt outlet down there, but you don't have any other connectivity. It doesn't get the USB-C things that it's more expensive variants get. As for room in here, I've still got a fair amount of tow room, even though that seat's as low as it'll go. Whoever sits there has more because that seat's annoyingly jacked up. There's a ton of headroom above me here and a ton of knee room, even though this seat doesn't adjust fore and aft. It's just generally pretty spacious. It, I think it's better in the 300 series as a five seater than it is as a seven seat. Now, while the GX is only a five seat, tumbling the back seats is still really easy because it's designed for seven people. So you just go here, down, bam, and like that. And that's where it holds when the luggage is in. And when you want to get back in, it just very quickly goes in a place. Climbing in the back is easy too, even though these doors don't open very wide because you've got the handle to make up for the fact that you don't have a sidestep. In terms of the baby seat fitment, the capsule is not really well suited to the five seat Land Cruiser. That seat in front of me has to be a long way forward to be able to get this in comfortably. But that said, it does clip in easily with the top tether nice and high on the rear backrest. Same applies to this child seat, clips in really easy at the back. I've actually got a reasonable amount of shoulder room in here between the seats, but the base of here, I reckon, is going to give me a numb ass fairly quickly. And I'm also sitting on the belt buckle for the normal seat belt on this side. The combined fuel consumption figure for the Toyota Land Cruiser GX is 8.9 litres per 100 kilometres, as it is for every other model in the range. However, we've averaged 10.3 litres per 100 kilometres in fairly heavy city driving, as well as some moderate off-roading. The warranty for Toyota in Australia is five years or unlimited kilometres, whereas the recommended servicing schedules for this vehicle are every six months or 10,000 Ks, each of those capped at $375, but across five years, that totals $3,750, which is reasonably expensive, but it also covers 100,000 kilometres worth of motoring, but two visits to the dealership every year. Over the past 12 months, the median Budget Direct customer has paid $1,263 to comprehensively insure a Toyota Land Cruiser. However, everybody's situation is different and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account like where you live, your driving history, and whether you garage your car. First, the elephant in the room with the GX versus GXL debate. While paying an extra 12k for the model above this gets you third row seating and third row curtain airbags, which does go quite a long way to justifying that price. It also gets front and rear parking sensors, it also gets blind spot monitoring, and it gets rear cross traffic alert, which are things that this spec doesn't have. 
that said, the GX still has AEB with daytime and nighttime pedestrian detection, but only day for cyclists. It has speed sign detection, it has lane departure warning with um, brake lane control, so it doesn't have the lane trace assist, which is so annoying on some of the upper spec models. It just brakes and moves it in a bit and beeps quite loudly. But as per many other Toyota models, you just hold this button down on the steering wheel here for a second or two, and then it goes away and leaves the car free of annoying intervention, which I think is really good. We also have 10 airbags, we have trailer sway control, it already has a standard trailer wiring harness, so stuff like that, this car is very much suited to the target market that it's going for. There has been some criticism about whether the V6 twin turbo diesel in this is actually new or whether it's a development of the old V8, but either way, I still think it's better than the V8 it replaces, particularly because of the transmission. Having a 10-speed automatic instead of a six-speed means it's got four more gears, sure, and it's meant to change gears twice as fast as it used to, but what it's about is just giving this constant surge of performance in the 300 series that just is addictive really it doesn't sound as good as a diesel v8 let's put it that way but it still sounds really good and for the most part unless you're absolutely hammering it it's really refined and even when it is hammering and it will hammer because the top speed is meant to be 210 k's an hour in this apartment block on wheels so it has power what it has actually is 700 newton meters from 1600 to 2600 rpm at which point the second turbo intervenes and then takes that from 2600 to 4000 rpm which is where the 227 kilowatts of maximum power come in and when you start to use the gear lever here to change up and down gears you realize that there's only really about 500 revs between these ratios so when you're sort of going into corners and using engine braking or more to the point requiring a very finite rev point if you're going slowly or you're towing something smoothly all that sort of stuff this drivetrain works super well having the really good steering wheel and having a pretty good driving position means the gx isn't really suffering compared to the upper spec models it doesn't have fan cooling it doesn't have electric adjustment and you do have to make compromises for that it also doesn't have any lumbar support adjustment so it is what it is but Having those 245 75 series tires means that the ride in this non-adaptively damped model, even though what we're about to go over is probably the lumpiest this car is ever gonna be, it's better than the GXL and the VX and that above it. And even though I said, why don't you add those Dillo Fit 18 inch alloys, they do take away a little bit from the ride of this car. Although these Dunlop Grand Trex don't love slippery surfaces. You do need to drive smoothly and with deference to the fact that this is still a 2.5 ton, very tall, four-wheel drive. That said though, it actually does drive really quite smoothly for that sort of vehicle. Having hydraulic rack and pinion steering, it goes a long way towards giving the 300 series Land Cruiser a level of dynamic precision. You just easily guide it into these corners. It's actually really nice to drive, like surprisingly nice and surprisingly responsive at the wheel. Even around town, I think that's where this GX really comes into its own. You're paying less, but you're getting more because it rides so much better and it just makes it more pleasant. Like the Sahara ZX at 140K list is ugh, compared to this, even with adaptive dampers, in my opinion. So there's nothing wrong with having the GX here. As for the actual handling, it's nowhere near as ponderous as it used to be. It's not as sweet as the GR Sport with its adaptive suspension. And you know, the ZX has a rear um, limited slip diff, which this doesn't have, but I don't really think that it needs it. I think it defeats the purpose of what a big separate chassis four drive like this is about. For a vehicle as large as the Land Cruiser, it lopes along pretty well. Sometimes this suspension setup, even with the GX's small tires, patters around over bumps and does betray the limitations of this style of body, but you're not buying this to be a BMW X5 competitor. You're buying a Land Cruiser like this for its breadth of talent. That's why it's got a bloody snorkel out there on the A-pillar on the left-hand side. And mind you, when you are driving it along quickly, the snorkel doesn't really make that much noise until you wind down the passenger window and then you hear this really quite loud I know you can still hear it, but it's nowhere near as loud as if you wind the window down. As for the performance, well, you don't really need 
any more than this. This is an effortlessly capable three and a half ton tower. This is not about trying to extract the best possible number so you can put that in the brochure. I think this car will romp at home. And so while the general refinement is really quite excellent, you can hear the diesel revving. You can hear the tires squealing when you are going too quickly in the GX, but generally it's just, it's effortlessly capable of going quick. Like, yeah, a little bit of tire squeal, but that's why you had the Dilfin alloys, right? As the entry level variant to the six model strong Land Cruiser 300 series range, I think the GX does a surprisingly good job. Sure, it's despecced in areas like those 17 inch steel wheels and having plain old intermittent wipers and vinyl floor and that, but where the things that matter, this car is actually really good at. The fact that it has those old school wheels means that it has the best ride of any Land Cruiser besides the GR Sport. And if you don't like them, just get the 18 inch wheels from the dealer. Just one little thing and a decent color makes this look like it's worth 20,000 bucks more than what it is. But I would suggest that the best model for a private buyer, unless you need that snorkel there, and also the practicality of a vinyl floor, is to just go for the GXL. It's $12,000 more, but it does bring a bunch of areas that do spec up this car to make it a little bit more livable. But that said, the seat comfort in here, the general refinement, the performance, the ride, and the just all round driver appeal is so strong that you never ever feel like you're in a commercial vehicle or the commercial variant until you look at what it looks like on the outside. Let us know what you think. How would you spec your GX? What variant would you choose if you could actually get your hands on one? And would you pay at least $118,000 for one of these considering that's currently the going rate for a 300 series GX in Australia? If you haven't subscribed, please do so below the video, hit the notification bell and comment on all the things I just mentioned or about chasing cars. Thanks for watching.